I will say with respect to that issue and perhaps touching on some other issues, today is not a day when I can take evidence and testimony and when I'm going to make factual determinations about certain things. For example, when defense says today that an independent entity of some sort reviewed that tape and determined that none of those things were said. Um, I can't make a finding of that today. There's no evidence of that today. By the same token, there was some reference to uh, what jurors may have said afterwards about whether they heard those same words or did not or considered them in any way. I'm not making any findings today. There's no testimony to that effect today. And this isn't the right uh, process to make those determinations. Uh, I am required to simply review what happened under that argument and make a determination of whether it rises to the level of prosecutorial misconduct. And both parties have talked about uh, recklessness. Um, I don't find that the statements or the questions on cross-examination asked by Attorney Hughes uh, rose to the level of recklessness or to the level of prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, there was argument repeatedly made to the jury that they would have to make their own determination. And again, the jury was properly instructed uh, as to statements by attorneys, burden of proof, uh, those types of things. Uh, I do not find that any statements made by uh, Attorney Hughes rise to the level of prosecutorial misconduct. The second issue uh, argued by counsel today uh, is ineffective assistance of counsel. And uh, again, today is not a day where I can make factual determinations about discussions that a uh, defendant had with his counsel and whether he told counsel certain things or they told him or didn't tell him certain things. I wouldn't be able to make those determinations without having counsel present to testify under oath. I do understand, Mr. Hamrock, that you have provided uh, a transcript of your client being under oath in a different proceeding, a probate proceeding, in which he did say, I did not authorize my attorneys uh, to say those things. Uh, I understand that. Uh, but generally speaking, ineffective assistance is an issue that's uh, typically dealt with on post-conviction relief. In this circumstance, based on the arguments that both parties have made, I do think that that is an issue that will have to be addressed on post-conviction relief. Uh, I do not find today based on the record we have here today, that the defendant um, was deprived of effective assistance of counsel. The third issue argued today uh, deals with the totality of the evidence, taking all of the evidence that came in and considering it in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, which is the state here, and defendant's argument that uh, considering all of that evidence in the light most favorable to the state, it still was not uh, physically possible for the defendant to have committed this act. Neither party has made any argument that the jury was improperly instructed. So we did have 12 jurors properly instructed on the law uh, after a lengthy trial who unanimously agreed to a finding of guilt. Ms. Hughes recited the law as it pertains to the burden today and what I have to consider, and I think she properly recited the law. I would say I think that I'm actually um, required, or at least that I should, independently weigh the evidence and consider credibility as it pertains to a motion for new trial. Uh, if the verdict is contrary to the weight of the evidence, the defendant is entitled to a new trial. Uh, I cannot say that the evidence in this case uh, or that the verdict is contrary to the weight of the evidence. Um, as to the defendant's motion 
for new trial and motion in arrest of judgment. I will deny those motions in their entirety. We will go ahead and proceed with sentencing at this time. We have not had, I don't believe, a pre-sentence investigation. Typically, we don't have one for a Class A felony. Um, and I will take argument from counsel to start. Ms. Hughes, do you want to make argument on behalf of the state? Yes, sir. Obviously, Your Honor knows that the defendant was convicted of murder in the first degree, which carries a sentence of a mandatory life imprisonment without parole. We, uh, Judge, you heard the evidence. You know what the defendant was charged with and what he was found guilty of. We would ask you to sentence the defendant accordingly. Mr. Hamrock, do you want to make argument on behalf of your client? Well, Judge, uh, in a Class A felony, there's not a lot of argument to be made, so... Uh, the court would go ahead and impose sentence. Your Honor, may I say something? Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, the court really doesn't have much discretion in this case other than in one area. That area is death of victim restitution. As the court is aware, that is a mandatory minimum $150,000. This case is such where that would not be justice. This individual came into court at the time of bond hearing and said he had the ability the cash to post $1 million against a bond. It is appropriate that this court at this time make that $1 million that he has available the death of victim restitution because that's the only thing I think is going to really hit home with this individual. Yes, he has to go to prison for life, but this trial was about greed and jealousy. The greed had to do with his farm and his money. So to really hit home, Judge, it would be appropriate for that money that he says he had available to go to death of victim restitution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mullis, you have the right to speak today if you'd like to. You're not required to. Your attorney has uh, spoken on your behalf. This is the only chance you'll get to speak today before I present, uh, before, before I pronounce judgment. Is there anything you would like to say today? I did not do this. Uh, this is supposed to be America where you have a fair chance of proving your innocence. We shouldn't have to prove your innocence instead of the other way around. I thought it was guilty until, or not, uh, innocent until proven guilty. I feel this is the other way around. And I was a faithful and loving husband, and I never did this. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Hamrack, do you have anybody else that would like to speak on behalf of your client? No, Judge. Are there any victims that wish to be heard today? Not, I, not I live know. testimony, Your Honor. The state did file a victim impact statement, and we would just ask that Your Honor, Honor read that. Okay. And there is a victim impact statement in the court file. I have read that, and I have conferred with counsel to make sure that they have had the opportunity to see that, that both parties have had the opportunity to see the victim impact statement. I will take that into consideration as if it were offered here live at the sentencing hearing. Defense counsel indicated that uh, the sentence in this case is mandatory. He's right, it is mandatory. There's really no discretion um, as to the punishment handed down. According to the statute, Mr. Mullis, for the charge of murder in the first degree pursuant to Iowa Code Section 707.2, you are sentenced to life in prison with no opportunity for parole. There will be no fine issued. You'll be required to submit a DNA sample to the state of Iowa. Uh, the reasons for my sentence today are primarily uh, the statutory requirement, the fact that there is no discretion. Uh, I will also uh, require you to pay a victim restitution uh, to the victim or to the estate of the victim in the amount of $150,000. You will be obligated to pay the court costs associated with this proceeding. You do have the right to appeal from this judgment. Written notice of appeal must be filed within 30 days of today's date uh, by statute according to Iowa Code Section 811.1, subsection 2, you cannot be admitted to bail in the event of appeal. 
Is there anything else the state knows of that we need to cover here today? I'm sorry. Nothing further, Your Honor. Sorry. Mr. Hamrock, anything else that you need to cover on the record today? No, Judge. Okay. We'll stand adjourned and close the record. Thank you, everyone. There you have it, Todd Mullis uh, being led away back to county jail. Um, I tell you folks, this is why we do what we do, the drama in a courtroom. Judge Bitter there denying the defense's motion for a new trial. Therefore, he went ahead to sentencing, and he really had no discretion in this case. He had to sentence him, according to Iowa law, to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Of course, um, the defendant here can move forward with a different appeal. Um, part of the reason they had to make this motion today is to preserve that right, so they probably will, actually I'm sure they will, um, continue with this appeal down the road, but that could take years, lots of drama. Uh, you have Todd Muller saying that in this case he felt he had to prove his innocence and that he did not do this, sounding uh, much more meek than he did uh, at his trial. So this is definitely uh, appears to be taking the toll. There's also the issue of restitution. Um, the prosecutor saying this case was about greed and jealousy and that he wanted $1 million in restitution. The judge went for the mandatory minimum, which was 150000 and court costs. A lot, lot to chew on here, folks. We'll take you back live to Iowa, where we'll hear from our legal correspondent, Chanley Painter, who was in the courtroom for today's action. We'll be back right after this break.